Coming up, Notre Dame is assembling its best class of defensive backs in a really long time. The transfer portal has come and gone, and the Irish added a literal giant to their special teams from Australia. That's next. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on and welcome into another edition of Locked On Irish. Today is Wednesday, May 2nd, and thank you for getting your day started right here by making this your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Tyler Wojak. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer at Fox Sports, and you can watch this episode as well as every other episode on YouTube, or you can listen wherever you get your podcast. If you are watching along on YouTube, please like the video below and subscribe to the channel, or if you're listening to the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe. This episode of Locked On Irish is brought to you by Monopoly Go, this fast-paced game lets you team up with friends for tournaments to unlock awesome prizes like unique stickers for trading, cool playing pieces, and hilarious emojis for taunting your friends. So download Monopoly Go now for free on Google Play or the App Store. Game on. Okay, quick programming note before we get rolling here. By the time that you're listening to this, I'm going to be on vacation. I'll be going back home to Louisville for the Kentucky Derby, and I'm so excited. I've been going to the Derby basically every year since I was like 14 years old. It's my favorite weekend of the year every single year. Then after that, I'm going to spend a week in Ireland. My girlfriend and I are going to visit my sister, who actually attends medical school at Trinity College in Dublin. So I'm basically going to be bouncing around the globe these next 10 days or so. And although I'm really excited to take some extended time off from both of my jobs, I do apologize. For the break in the action, I'll be back with another episode on Tuesday, May 14th, though, so I won't be gone for too long. All right, let's get into it because we have plenty to talk about in today's show. I want to dive a little bit deeper into four-star defensive back Dallas Golden's commitment that happened a few days ago. Plus, the Irish appear to be the favorite for another elite cornerback prospect in Mac, or excuse me, Mark Zachary. He's going to be making his announcement here uh, in a few days. Also, the transfer portal is officially closed, and it was a really quiet cycle for Notre Dame. So, I have some thoughts on that. Then, at the end, Marcus Freeman and Marty Biaggi found a new punter. They had to travel down under to get him, but they got him, and he's a big. Commitment. I mean that literally. He's massive for a punter. But let's start with Dallas Golden because, like I said, he made his uh, commitment official on Sunday, and I believe he is the most talented prospect in this class for Notre Dame. They still have the number one ranked class in the class of 2025. Dallas Golden is the 20th commitment in that class, which is pretty crazy because there's no other team that is coming close to 20 commitments. But of those 20, I believe that Dallas Golden is the best. I would say that Deuce Knight is the most important commit because he is the quarterback and he's also highly rated. I just don't think he is all the natural gifts that a player like Dallas Golden has. Dallas Golden is ranked as the 94th ranked player in the country, according to the 24-7 sports composite, but I think that is way too low. I think he should be top 50 at the absolute minimum, probably closer to the top 25. I think he's that good. It actually reminds me a little bit of Kingston Viliamu Asa, who was ranked 41st in the country, but I think he should have been higher, and I think we all saw that in spring practice when he showed up ready to play from day one. I will say, though, about Dallas Golden that he's not as physically ready to contribute right away as Kingston Viliamu Asa. Golden is only six foot tall, 176 pounds, so that's a, that's at least what he's listed as. So he's probably you know an inch or two shorter than that, uh, than that and probably like 10 pounds lighter because we know how it goes with these high school prospects and their heights and weights. So Golden is going to have to put on some muscle, but every time he steps on the field in high school at Berkeley Prep down in uh, Tampa, Florida, he's the best player on the field, whether it's on offense, whether it's on defense, whether he's back there returning punts or kicks. Every time that Dallas Golden steps on the field and he's playing against really quality competition, he is the best player out there, and you can see that on film. He plays wildcat quarterback. He can play corner and safety on defense, and like I said, he's their primary return man. And it is just so fun to watch him because when he has the ball in his hands, he's so explosive, and he has this weird ability of like just knowing exactly where defenders are. He doesn't have these like crazy juke moves that like a Reggie Bush would have, but he's so slippery and elusive and guys just can't catch him down. He's faster than whoever is chasing him. So he's really good on offense and defense. You can see his explosiveness in different ways. On offense, it's with the ball in his hands. On defense, it's whenever he's breaking towards the ball or making a play on the ball if he has to go up and deflect a pass. But he is just such a joy to watch. And I think something that's really interesting about him is that he apparently wants to play nickel 
when he's in college. That's at least what he told Lockdown's recruiting insider, Brian Smith. Um, Brian came on the show a few weeks ago. He's from Florida, had a chance to catch up with Dallas Golden in person. And Dallas Golden told Brian he wanted to play nickel at the college level. I, I thought that was really surprising. And I also thought it was telling about the, uh, the type of football player that he is because nickel isn't like the most fun position in the world to play if you're a defensive back, because it's not like you're just out there covering wide receivers and making a play on the ball. Like if you're the nickel, you're going to have to line up in the box. Sometimes you're going to have to go try and shed blocks off a tight end. You're going to have to make tackles on the, on the running back in open space um, or around the line of scrimmage. It is not an easy task. And it's, uh, it's why um, Notre Dame has often gone into the transfer portal to find a graduate transfer to play that position. Like they did this past year with Jordan Clark and the year before with Thomas Harper, both were graduate students when Notre Dame added them. And it's kind of a position for grown ass men. So the fact that Dallas Golden's like, no, that's the position I want to play shows that one, he really loves football and he likes doing the, the dirty work, I guess you could say, when you're playing on the defensive uh, defensive side of the ball. And I just think he recognizes, hey, nickel, it's it's a nickel world. Like Al Golden said last year, if you're the nickel, you're going to be on the field a lot, especially in Al Golden's defense. And I think he's good for it. He, like I said, he's going to have to put on some muscle, though, because he doesn't quite have the frame to hold up at that position right now. But I think he could end up being a really, really quality nickel once he gets to college. I mentioned before he went to Berkeley Prep. That is the same school where Keon Keeley famously went, or maybe I should say infamously. Um, also, Nelson Aguilar, the wide receiver who ended up at USC and who's made a, a good career for himself in the NFL. Notre Dame was really recruiting him hard. And uh, they just really have not been able to land guys from that school. And it's it's kind of a bummer because there's not a ton of schools in Florida that fit like the Notre Dame theme and, and uh, the fit there. But Berkeley Prep is certainly one of those schools. And it's great that Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame were finally able to land a top prospect from that school. And as Pete Sampson said the other day when he came on the show, Dallas Golden was about as big of a camp miss prospect for Notre Dame as you could possibly get, not only because of the talent level, but also because of the fit. I think Dallas Golden is going to blend right in at Notre Dame uh, as a student athlete, and I think he has a really, really bright future ahead of him. So now let's look at the class impact. Notre Dame's top two rated commits in the entire class are defensive backs. Ivan Taylor is still uh, the top overall commitment on pretty much every recruiting site you look at. He's a top 50 player. He's going to play safety for Notre Dame. He is the son of uh, NFL's legend. I guess you could call it, eh, I might be exaggerating a little bit. Ike Taylor was just really good, and he was always great against the Browns, so I think of him as a legend. Either way, Ivan Taylor, really good prospect, and now Dallas Golden is right behind him in the recruiting rankings. They also have commitments from three stars, uh, Cree Thomas, who's a cornerback, and safety Ethan Long out of Connecticut. So they have four quality defensive backs in the class right now, but I expect they're going to add another here, Uh, and in terms of ability, I'd put them right up there with Dallas Golden and Ivan Taylor. I'm referring to Mark Zachary the fourth. Zachary is a high four star. He's listed as the number six cornerback in the class on 24-7 sports, and he's a really, really talented player. He's a little bit undersized, listed at 5'10 and a half, 164 pounds, but he's extremely explosive. He's got crazy bounce. He's a really, really good basketball player as well, and he's from Indianapolis, so you know that the quality of high school basketball in Indiana is really good, and he's a great player there for his high school. Uh, he also has really long arms, like abnormally long arms for someone who's only 5'10", so he kind of fits the profile of what Notre Dame is looking for in their cornerbacks. And I think Zachary is another guy that is a can't miss prospect for Notre Dame. And I don't think Notre Dame is going to miss. I think uh, Mark Zachary is going to end up in this class for Notre Dame. And if, and when he commits publicly, Notre Dame would have a full five man secondary in this class. You would have Cree Thomas and Mark Zachary as the true corners golden at the nickel and then Taylor and long at safety. That's a really, really quality group. Not just in terms of quantity, because if you add five defensive backs in a class, that's that's a lot. Normally, you're only going to get three or four, but this year Notre Dame is getting five, and I believe it would be the best class of defensive backs Notre Dame has had in my lifetime, and I was born in 1996. I think they have the top high-end talent in Ivan Taylor, Mark Zachary, and Dallas Golden. Those are three really good players, and all three of them are going to have a chance to play right away. 
I wouldn't think that they're going to start, especially considering the fact that Notre Dame is recruited really well, particularly at cornerback. Like Christian Gray and Jane Mickey are probably going to start next year once Benjamin Morrison is off to the NFL. But we've seen those guys get playing time um, as younger players, and I think that um, Dallas Golden, Mark Zachary, and Ivan Taylor can all do that. They'd probably be like third or fourth on the quarterback depth chart for Zachary and Golden, and then I think Ivan Taylor, um, he's going to be sitting behind – uh, well, I guess we'll have to wait and see who ends up starting at safety next year for Notre Dame. But I think Ivan Taylor is going to have a real chance to make a dent on the depth chart early on. And then you've got Cree Thomas and Ethan Long, probably more developmental pieces, but I think they also have really bright futures at Notre Dame. So really, really great group, really, really exciting for the Notre Dame football program because for a while there, defensive backs, were, they were almost always a liability on this team. They just... Notre Dame did not really land that many good ones under Brian Kelly. They obviously had Julian Love, who was one of the best in a really long time, Kyle Hamilton at safety. Like, there were certainly exceptions, but as a whole, Notre Dame just was not landing elite defensive uh, back prospects, and now it seems like they're doing it on a year-to-year basis, and that's a huge testament to the work that Marcus Freeman has done, Mike Mickens has done since he's been the cornerbacks coach and now the coach of all the defensive backs at Notre Dame, and really, as long as those two are around, there's really no reason for me to believe that it's going to stop anytime soon. Notre Dame, DBU, it might be a little bit premature, but I could see it. I could see it in a few years. Okay, coming up next, the transfer portal came and went, and Notre Dame... Didn't really see a lot of action. That's next. It's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL, and FanDuel's giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. The transfer portal is closed. The spring window for undergraduates to enter the transfer portal began on April 16th, and now it has closed. To be clear, graduate students can enter at any time, so there is still a chance that Notre Dame could end up losing some players so long as that player has earned their degree from Notre Dame, then they can enter in the transfer portal even in the summer, really at any point in the season. The Irish can still add guys as well, so it's not like the transfer portal news has completely come to an end, but I think that the big wave, all the major moves have come and gone. I also expect Notre Dame will um, lose some guys at the bottom of their 85-man roster. They're either going to medically retire or they might just lose their football scholarship but still remain on scholarship academically. I think we're going to find out more about that. There's a couple guys who certainly would be candidates uh, for that to happen. I'm not going to name names here, but you get my point, right? Notre Dame is a few guys over the 85-man scholarship limit. They need to get back under that, and I think you know, in this new era of NIL and the chance to port all that stuff, it's not like guys are being cut, but guys are being asked to move on, and I think that has happened with this Notre Dame team. But if you look at this most recent cycle for Notre Dame, they lost three guys, and when you consider last year, um, when Notre Dame lost Tyler Buckner and Logan Diggs. What Notre Dame lost this year compared to last year, big difference. They lost cornerbacks Clarence Lewis, who ended up at Syracuse, another corner, Micah Bell, who is yet to commit to his school at the time of this recording, and punter Bryce McPherson, who I believe committed to Maryland. So losing Clarence Lewis was a tough blow for depth. I went over that before on this podcast. I thought at first losing Bryce McPherson was a big surprise, but then Pete Sampson kind of clarified, like, hey, he's uh, – been really inconsistent in the spring, and his starting job that he had last year was not guaranteed for the next season, so I think he was like, oh, I'm going to just make a move myself then. So now he's at Maryland. Losing Micah Bell, that just happens. Notre Dame is a really deep cornerback room, and I think he realized that his path to playing time was pretty rocky, especially considering that Christian Gray, a player who was younger than him, had already jumped him on the depth chart, and as I was saying in segment one, Notre Dame continues to recruit really talented defensive backs every single year. So When you look at it, yes, I would have liked Notre Dame to have added a a starting offensive tackle in the transfer portal if that player had even become a possibility, this hypothetical player that I'm talking about. And guess what? It never did. Uh, I know I saw some fans see that the left tackle from UCLA entered the transfer portal. He started for the Bruins last year, and they're like, oh, Notre Dame should add him. No, they shouldn't. That guy stinks. So they didn't talk to him at all, and now Notre Dame is going to roll with what they have at the tackle positions. It is what it is. But... I think the fact that no one else left, it says a lot of good things about where the program is at right now. Guys don't want to leave, right? There are several guys on this roster who I'm sure were offered lots of money to go elsewhere. Guys like Xavier Watts, Benjamin Morrison. I, I, I'm i not reporting anything, by the way. I, don't, I have no 
intel here when I'm saying this, but this is how college football works. The best teams in the country are able to attract the best players and other teams with huge bags of money. It's kind of been going on for a long time, but especially now in the transfer portal era, and I feel very confident that Notre Dame, given the amount of really talented players on their roster, they probably had to deal with some sort of tampering at some point or another, but fortunately, the guys on Notre Dame's roster want to stay at Notre Dame, and Notre Dame has uh, an NIL program that is able to keep those guys around. I think it's a a testament to what Marcus Freeman has done, not only in building the culture, but keeping the program, or really I should say getting the program to this point where guys want to stay. Um, If you think about it, Marcus Freeman is entering his third year as the head coach of Notre Dame. So a lot of the guys on the roster are guys that he recruited. So they wanted to play for him out of high school, and they still want to play for him after playing with him or playing for him, I should say, for a few years. And I think, you know, when you look at other programs around the country, there's always going to be a little bit of attrition in the transfer portal. Guys at the bottom of the roster are going to leave. But, you know, there's programs that are seeing starters leave who, who, you know, are traditionally like maybe not elite programs, but pretty respectable programs. They're seeing guys leave for better, pa- or better, you know, better situations. And now Notre Dame is in a place where, hey, even though, they had somewhat of a disappointing season last year, finishing 9-3. and I believe they should have been a lot better than that, especially when you look at how many guys got selected in the NFL draft and where they got selected. Either way, um, I think that Notre Dame is in a really great spot as Marcus Freeman enters a pivotal year of three. Um, I still think Notre Dame could end up adding a defensive back uh, out of the transfer portal to replace Clarence Lewis and Micah Bell. I don't think they're going to add two guys, but I could definitely see them um, adding one just for depth purposes. It seems like Benjamin Morrison's recovery from shoulder surgery is going well. So if everything goes to plan, they'll still have uh, Benjamin Morrison starting, and then opposite him, they'll have either uh, Jane Mickey or Christian Gray. Uh, and then at nickel, they got Jordan Clark. But then behind them, it gets a little bit dicey. A lot of young guys on the roster, so... Notre Dame was, uh, they hosted Treshawn Devonis from Rice. I don't know what, where he's leaning. I think that he could probably get more playing time somewhere else. So um, I think that's probably where he's going to end up. They also uh, offered a player who was um, out of West Virginia recently. So they're still in the market for guys, but I think that overall they're pretty settled with where they're at. And I think that's a really good thing because Notre Dame just had 15 practices in spring practice, and they basically did it with their whole roster intact. So that's really good because if Notre Dame was in a position where they're like, man, coming out of spring practice, they need a starting safety, they need a starting linebacker, they need a, another starting wide receiver, like that's really an uncomfortable position to be on, uh, to be in because there's just not as many guys in this spring window than there were in the window that happened right after the regular season. So Notre Dame isn't going to be like desperately adding guys just because they need to fill a spot even if that player isn't really good enough for where they're trying to get to. Notre Dame doesn't have that problem. And I think the culture is in a really, really good place. Yes, they still need to win more um, just because the culture is great. You know, if, if, it's, if it's not translating to wins and losses on the field on Saturdays in the fall, then it really doesn't matter. But I feel like given the way that Marcus Freeman is recruited, given the way that guys have developed on the roster, and given how the schedule is set up for the Irish this season, I really think they're poised to have a really, really excellent year. And I'll be honest, I think the biggest surprise of this whole deal was that none of the quarterbacks entered the transfer portal. Like, I was pretty certain that either Steve Angeli or Kenny Minchie would end up making a move. Maybe Steve Angeli, if he, I think he's on track to graduate here shortly, maybe he decides really late. But I don't think he's going to do that because all the good spots are going to be taken if he decides to leave, you know, a month from now or something like that. So it's a, it's a surprise for sure, at least to me. Uh, maybe you never thought that any of the quarterbacks were going to transfer Good on you. That was a good prediction, but I just looked at it as in the the way the college football works and has been working for a really long time. Like usually you don't have four scholarship quarterbacks on the roster, but it looks like that's exactly what Notre Dame is going to have heading into fall camp. And not only do they have four scholarship quarterbacks, they have four really good quarterbacks. They're not all ready to start right now, but I think one day all four of those guys will end up starting a lot of games at the uh, at the collegiate level, whether or not it's it's at Notre Dame remains to be seen. But I, I've said it before, they've had NFL starters in the past on, on different Notre Dame teams, but they've never really had the depth necessary to compete for championships. And now they're getting dangerously close. They're not there yet. They still need more of those elite, elite first round NFL draft prospects before they really get over the hump and start competing for the national championship every year. But one big takeaway 
from when they went into the college football playoff uh, in 2018 and in 2020 was they just didn't have the depth to hang with the best teams in college football, and they're getting closer to that. And it's it's harder than ever to sustain that depth given the transfer portal and the, given the freedom that these players have to leave whenever they want. Guys really don't want to sit around and wait that often, but it seems like on this team, guys are willing to wait around. They're ready to compete. They're going to compete for whatever role they have on the roster, and they want to be a part of this team. And I really think it's going to be a special, special team to be a part of. So kudos to those guys for sticking around, competing, and uh, really just doing everything they can to get this team back to where it needs to be. Okay, last segment coming up here. Notre Dame added a player yesterday, but he was not in the transfer portal. He was down under in Australia. I'll tell you all about him right after this. All right, game off. We got to pause here to talk more about Monopoly Go. I know what you're saying. Flag on the play. You've already talked about that, but there is just so much good stuff in this game. In Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends for time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you unlock. And there's so much to get, including unique stickers you can trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes, cool new playing pieces to travel the boards with, hilarious emojis for taunting friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or a Robot Pachinko Machine. And there's always new timed events that help you win big like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench to go download it now for free on Google Play or the App Store. Game on. Okay, our long, painful wait is over. Notre Dame has found their new starting punter, and it is James Rendell out of Australia. The thing that stands out to me the most about Rendell, his size. He's six foot six, 235 pounds. He's got a jawline that could cut gravel, and he looks like a defensive end. Now, granted, he is 23 years old, but still, a six foot six, 235 pounds pound punter is it's a pretty hilarious visual and I would certainly be afraid to tackle him if Notre Dame ever ran a fake punt and I was just some walk-on on special teams out there trying to make a play Rendell has not played American football before at least competitively at any level like this but he's played Australian football throughout his life his dad Matt Rendell was a major figure in the AFL both as a player and in the media so the family name holds some weight out there and the pipeline of Australian football players to the college football uh, game is really, really strong. I remember Les Miles had like a new Australian punter every single year when he was the head coach at LSU and a lot of other programs around the country have started to catch on. They have done this before and there are programs out there in Australia who basically take Australian football players and groom them to be punters and then they end up going Um, to colleges around the country, and then several of them have made it to the National Football League. So this transition, although it might be a little bit surprising, it might not be what we expected, is really not that out of the ordinary. Uh, Friend of the program, recruiting insider Kevin Sinclair from Irish Illustrated, actually had the chance to interview James Rendell, and I encourage you to go on Irish Illustrated and check out that interview uh, because I thought Rendell shared some really interesting insights, including the fact that he did not get drafted into the AFL, the Australian Football League, in 2018. So Right when that happened, he got back into playing some more Australian football, but realized quickly, hey, this probably isn't going to be in my future. So at that time, he became interested in punting, and he joined Pro Kick Australia, which is one of those programs that I just was referring to, which develops Australian football players into punters. They've sent hundreds of players on full scholarships to college, according to Rendell. And Marty Biaggi, the special teams coordinator at Notre Dame, traveled all the way to Australia recently to meet the family and get this done. Personally, I have never done the flight from South Bend to Australia. The longest flight I've ever done was uh, going from Dublin to LA, and that was terrible. And now that I think about that, I just remember that I'm going to have to do that again in a couple weeks. Either way, not the point right now, but Biagi had to go a long way to get this done. And James said that Marty has been great throughout this process, and I thought it was interesting that pretty much from the moment that Bryce entered his name into the transfer portal, Marty Biaggi was sort of focused on finding an Australian punter, and he, and he found his guy in James Rundell. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that adding a punter is like the biggest deal in the world, but Notre Dame really needed one. They didn't really have any other options. They had Goins, who's the, uh, he's like 30-something. He's the guy who uh, went to the Citadel, was a kicker and punter, and then joined the military, was a part of that uh, for several years. And now that his service is done, he is 
back playing college football because he still has eligibility. Uh, eligibility. But he's a walk-on, and I don't think Notre Dame was really hoping that he'd be uh, a serious contributor to the team on Saturdays this fall. But Notre Dame's defense is going to be incredible next year. And if Rendell can uh, become a really good punter, then that helps the defense even more. We know that the defense is going to be stingy, but even if you have a really stingy defense in college football, if you're not winning the field position battle and you continue to put your defense in a really poor position, then you know they're going to give up some points. It just happens, right? Like college offenses are too good for teams to just continually shut them down and get a three and out every single drive, even though that's what some fans are going to expect from this group this season. So I thought... You know, this was a, a very important thing for Notre Dame to get done. They got it done, and it's it's going to be fun, man. I think it's going to be hilarious. Like the visual of a six foot six punter out there um, is going to be entertaining at the very least, and I think he's going to have an impact on this team. I hope Notre Dame runs a couple fakes to him just to see him get out with the ball and and uh, make a play. But uh, look, they had to get it done. They got it done, and now I think this will be uh, this will be a big boost for that defense, which. Doesn't really need a huge boost to begin with, but any little bit helps, especially when this defense is going to be leading the team. And if they can become what we all think they can be, then Notre Dame is going to be right there competing for the national championship or maybe just a deep run in the playoff at the very end. But excited about this. I think it's going to be fun to watch. And credit to Marty Biasi for making the flight there and back to get this over the line. Okay, that's going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making Locked On Irish your first listen today. Remember, I'm going to be away on vacation for a little over a week. I'll be back on Tuesday, May 14th, and then we'll be right back into the swing of things. In the meantime, please remember to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the pod so that once I'm back dropping a new episode every weekday, you'll get notified right away. Have a great next couple weeks. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there, and I'll talk to you again soon.